everyone, and welcome to First Things First. It's a Monday morning. I'm Jenna Wolf. That is the Hall of Famer, Chris Carter. That is Nick Wright. Good weekend, CC. Great weekend. Yeah. How was you guys' weekend? We were fantastic. good, but we we didn't we weren't at the Sixers game Friday night. We didn't jet all over the place and then make it back in time for our show. That wasn't the weekend. CC just had. an international man, a mystery no, man. No, 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 no. Jimmy Butler giving you his shoes. Oh, Jimmy Butler, that's my guy. Uh, yeah, as a, talk to Ben Simmons family. <laughs> that's my new guy. Yeah, uh, a lot going on. I'm just curious if the people in Minnesota are a little upset with you. You embrace Jimmy right after he gives them the stiff arm. Yeah, the people, come on, man. I've done so much there. I'm beyond all Okay. That. Let's all right. get it. Fair Let's, Let's get it. We got a big show for you today. Big Ben led a huge comeback. Saints might be the team to beat in the NFL, but we're going to start with the Dallas Cowboys. Dak Prescott and the boys trying to make it two wins in a row for the first time all season. This was a slow game till the fourth. Zeke giving Dallas a 19-9 to lead with a 23-yard touchdown run. But the Falcons would come all the way back, evening it up with a 34-yard touchdown pass from Matty Ryan to Julio Jones, just under two minutes to play. All right, 44 ticks left. Dak Prescott looking to get something going here. And he finds Cole Beasley, gets it down to the Falcons' 30. That would set up a 42-yard field goal for Brett Maher, who nails it. Cowboys win. They're now 5-5. Five and five. That made Jerry a very happy man. Here is Dak Prescott after the win. Our backs are against the wall, uh, and they're still against the wall. Um, and just the fact this shows the character of this team, of us just of us swinging and fighting and coming out, and um, the ups and downs in this game, adversity, success, the way we just played through it and stayed together as a team and able to go down there and uh, make that game win a field goal. I mean, credit Brett. I uh, missed one earlier in the game and to come back. Uh, that shows that shows the character right there, just just within him, and then to make that game win a field goal when when it mattered was huge. All right, Nick. So how do we see this Dallas team now? Suddenly, this is a team that's winning in a winnable division. Are we starting to see the Cowboys as a playoff team? I think you have no choice. You have no yeah. choice given how the, what they've done the last two weeks. Two weeks ago, we were in a position where Washington was 6-2 and two with a healthy quarterback, a healthier offensive line, and the Cowboys hadn't won a game on the road. Since then, the yes. Cowboys won at Philadelphia, had what I thought was their best defensive performance of the season yesterday, given who their opponent was against the Falcons, and they followed the script. There is a benefit, C, to talking about the Cowboys as often as we do, <laughs> which is we got this team down. What is the script for Dallas? Dak play a clean game, yes. give the ball to Zeke 25-plus times, and trust the defense to be something that people don't want to acknowledge it as, which is one of the absolute elite front sevens in all of football. And then, in the critical moments, if you have to, ask Dak to make two or three plays. And yesterday, it was check, check, check. And while they were playing, unfortunately and really, I mean, sports-wise, tragically, Alex Smith got his legs snapped. And now all of a sudden, the Eagles look cooked. They, we found that out later in the day. The Giants already are the, cooked. The Giants been cooked since week one. <laughs> and Washington is about to start Colt McCoy on a Thursday night in Dallas. So everything that could have gone right for Dallas the last two weeks has. So you have to look at them as a playoff And team. they're one of the few teams from, a old, from an old-school standpoint as far as moving forward, if they understand who they are, they can do it. They can play old school. They can play defense. Their defense, as we said, the preseason coming into the season, we thought that would be probably the most underrated part of the team. They've lived up to that. And now, from an offensive standpoint, Dak throw the ball less than 30 times. Zeke touched the ball at least 20 to 25 times. Our biggest problem was, Jenna, through the first eight games, they didn't know this. So it wasn't like all of a sudden now we're getting all this new information. The Cowboys all along should be a playoff team. When you look at the kind of talent that they have, even though they're still very, very young, they should be a playoff team. But when you can't win on the road, and then also what happened to Washington over the last couple weeks, they're one of the teams that we thought, man, there's going to be a team to catch fire in November and December right. and finally galvanize their season. Who are going to be those teams? teams Dallas Cowboys are leading the pack and also you have to keep an eye on what's going on in that division so they had the opportunity to be able to recover other teams in other divisions that don't have the same problems at the top they won't be able to recover but it seems like the Cowboys are going to be able to do that so Nick if they are going to make the playoffs 
what's more important? Because we know what Zeke's going to do. Is it Dak playing well or is it that defense playing well? Which oh. is going to have to be the, the more sureable thing? The defense. Listen, the Cowboys lead the league in games allowing 20 points or fewer. Seven times this year, they've held their opponent to 20 points or fewer in the highest scoring year in league history. Like, the defense has to be great throughout. You said we know what Zeke's going to do. We know what Zeke needs to do. Like, there is no better indicator on if the Cowboys win or lose than Zeke's stat line. Just look at it. Wins, losses. Zeke Elliott, we can show you the splits. He In wins, he's given you over 121 on the ground. There it is. 121 on the ground and 44 catching. Those are in wins. Uh, in losses, less than 70 on the ground and half of that receiving. Like, when, when he's great, they win. When he's average, they don't. And for those, like, so I agree with you. We know what Zeke needs to do. And if he looks like he did the last two weeks, I think the defense is going to be consistent. But does he look like that if they're giving him the touches and the carries? Because in the beginning, they just weren't, and those weren't his numbers. Um, no, Zeke is, he's proven himself. When he's in the lineup and when they give him the ball, there is no theory behind. They just didn't make enough first downs. They played bad offensive football, didn't get productivity outside, and when they needed Dak to be clutch, he couldn't be clutch. So they weren't a good offense. Zeke was the best part of that offense, and we know that they had a number of changes that they were going through on the offensive line. The most significant thing for me is not only changing the attitude, Scott Lanahan, and what they're calling offensively, it has been the offensive line. When they changed offensive line coaches, appointed Mark Colombo, the former Cowboy offensive lineman, you can see that they're starting to double team more, use their size, and you could see they were getting um, Zeke into the secondary quite often and that's what you have to be able to do with the Cowboys that's what we saw in Philadelphia last week on the road and that's what we saw um, last uh, yesterday in Atlanta Zeke getting into that secondary and you can see he's a special runner when he gets in open space and I want to give Chris credit for seeing something before it happened that I wouldn't have that I wouldn't have seen and I didn't see coming which is what the addition of Amari Cooper does for the Cowboys rushing attack what the the just the threat even if he hasn't been productive since his second year in the league he, and even if he's yet to have a huge game with Dallas yeah. you are seeing that teams cannot just say we're going to put eight in the box 90 percent of the plays and dare you to throw it they have enough respect for what he can do and what he has done at some point in his career that Zeke is having easier running lanes mm -hmm. and he has to make one guy miss instead of two guys miss and he makes it easier for the others. He makes it Michael Gallup. For him to be a number two, a young guy, a third-round pick, a lot of speed. You can see late in the game, Amari didn't make the play, but he got the coverage. Mm -hmm. Gallup was able to run the deep comeback on the outside. That was one thing we didn't see from Dallas and also from Dak throwing the ball deep and outside late in the game. We've seen Cole Beasley. He runs the choice route to be able to seal the game to get him in, um, in um, game-winning field goal range he, because of the coverage on Amari. So his overall effect to allow this offense to, to thrive, you can see it when you watch the tape. But wasn't the, 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 the addition of Amari Cooper Yes, to help free up uh, Zeke a little bit, but also to see what we can get from Dak. And if Dak's was, not using Amari Cooper, then... It was both. And listen, we, I, the, here's where I want to give Dak credit. Dak had, going into that final drive, Dak had 100 yards passing to wide receivers. He was not throwing. And then on the final drive, he made three big plays. A throw to Gallup, a throw to Zeke, which was a little bit of a dump off. Zeke did the work, and then the big throw to Beasley. But I think it was, I think the reason you got Amari Cooper was multi-layered, but primarily it was they were trying to make the playoffs. Jerry Jones didn't want to have to fire everyone, didn't want to have a lost season. Mm -hmm. Amari Cooper makes them better. Yeah, he makes them a lot better. And when you watched... It doesn't necessarily equate to what's going to be on the sheet after the game, the stat sheet, but what he makes his defenses do and make them play honest, it results in that less pressure on him, more one-on-one -on -one throwing lanes for the other wide receivers, and one less person in the box for Zeke and that offensive line, and that's what we've seen the last couple weeks. All right, Cowboys walk away with the win. They are very much in the playoff hunt. Talk much more about this. Eric Mangini will join us in a little bit, but first, coming up, how was Pittsburgh able to steal a win yesterday? That's next on First Things First. Welcome back. We'll get to Steelers Jags in a second, but first, Lions wide receiver Kenny Galladay drives backwards to make the great touchdown grab. He's been one of the better stories of the year, Kenny Galladay. 
He, a guy that at the beginning of the season kind of jumped onto the scene. He made some big plays in the Lions' comeback yesterday. He's turned into Matt Stafford's favorite target. It's one of the reasons they thought they could get rid of Golden Tate. Great throw by Matthew Stafford, too. He's been awesome. He's been really good. All right, moving on. Cowboys, Falcons. Now, watch this. Matt Ryan overthrows Julio Jones. Julio has to turn into a defender against safety Jeff Heath. Given their injuries, see, he might be the best defensive back they have left. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, this yeah. was a huge play in the that game. That was a huge play. Very smart. The wide receiver knows he has no chance. Once you know you have no chance to catch the ball, you must turn into a defender, even if you have to interfere with them because you still have possession of the football. All right, college football, Wisconsin's Danny Davis makes an unbelievable one-handed touchdown grab. Oh, you don't see that out of Wisconsin very often now. Let me Sorry. see that. Now, this right here will be my evidence when I present my case About that it gloves. is the gloves. <laughs> About the gloves, I knew it. When the people in Wisconsin <laughs> start grabbing it like that, it must be the gloves. <laughs> like, they known for stuff, but gloving, it's not it. Producing I'm big old linemen and things like that. But not that. I mean, it's the gloves, people. But he does a good job holding off the defender with the left hand, right? Going up and snagging it. Did he land in bounds here? Yeah, Did he get one a cheek? butt cheek. One butt oh, cheek. Okay. Uh, one butt say, cheek equals two feet. Cheeks. Now yep. I need to know. Corner. All right, Big Ben and the Steelers trying to make it six wins in a row, taking on the team that, for whatever reason, has their number in the Jaguars. Ben throwing three picks, including that one into the end zone to Jalen Ramsey. See, got their number. Steelers down 16 nothing. Then the comeback begins down three with less than a minute to go Roethlisberger connects with Antonio Brown who takes it down to the two all right we got eight seconds left Big Ben runs in for the touchdown Jalen Ramsey cannot believe it Jags have lost six straight now Steelers go on to win 20 to 16 here is Ben on the comeback we just never quit, you know, and that, that's what's kind of special about this group is we're going to fight to the end, and we literally fought to the end. Against a defense that's let, you know, they make their feelings known, how did it feel for you to get the last lap in this case? Well, they're, they're a really good defense. Like I said, they, they like to talk a lot uh, before the game, during the game, um, but I'm, I'm carrying the game ball home. It's a very happy Ben Roethlisberger right there. Mm -hmm. All right, Nick, what did the Steelers show you from this come-from-behind win last night? Man, that the Jags do have their number. Like, that the Jags, something about this Jags something defense about this team. really bedevils Ben Roethlisberger. Even in the playoff game where the Steelers put up a bunch of points, he was throwing pick after pick. But it also showed me this Steelers team is, has, is resilient, is well coached and recognized, man, there are no giveaway games here. It would have been so easy. I, I, I know you don't really quit in a football game, but when you are down 16 nothing and you can't, the one time you've moved the ball and ended with a pick in the end zone, it wouldn't have shocked me if they would have said, you know what, we're going to run James Conner, see if he pops one, and it's just not our day. And that's not what they did. And they got, to me, their best win of the year, all things considered. Their most impressive win of the year, all things considered. And he, with a loss, they're all of a sudden the fourth record in the AFC. With a win, they maintain the second best record in the AFC. It's clearly in, in sports there are teams that match up better against other teams and sometimes it's not on the tail of the tape you just can't see it it's not all oh, I think their linebackers are good against their run game sometimes you just can't. how they match up against Pittsburgh's offense from a Jacksonville defensive standpoint and they force Pittsburgh into multiple turnovers almost every time they play them. So when you have that type of recipe, now what they typically have the last several games, Jacksonville over Pittsburgh, is also they've had more explosive offenses by Blake Bortles. They had that the first half. They were not able to make any adjustments in the second half. That was the biggest thing in this game. When I look at this game, and I thought your points were, were, were exactly as far as the matchups, certain teams have other teams' numbers. But you don't win five games in a row just by accident sure. in this league. So you could start to see the Pittsburgh Steelers. And there's three things I'm going to take from this game.
Number one, old spicy mouth Jalen Ramsey. He is a hell of a football player. And when he is focused, there is a style. The reason why he plays that way, his height, his speed, his intensity, his ability to be able to catch the football. That's why he's a special, special footballer. That was the number one thing I took from the game. He was great. Number two thing I took from the game, Mike Tomlin is a good football coach. And you could see it down 16-0. The adjustment they made at halftime and what they did to them in the fourth quarter. From a strategy standpoint, that was my second point. Third point is Ben Roethlisberger is a bad dude. That's the reason why he's going to be a Hall of Famer. He's won so many games like this in bad weather, on the road, looks bad for a half, three quarters. But All but five minutes. When it is money time, it's like he's like one of those veteran quarterbacks like Aaron Rodgers, like Tom Brady. They can have two and a half, three bad quarters, and then come light you up. And from the, if you look at the game from the time they were down 16-0 and look what Ben did, his numbers were phenomenal. So those are the three things that I thought you should really take. You shouldn't leave that game and not know. Jalen Ramsley's special. Mike Tomlin is a very, very good football coach. You can see from a strategy standpoint. And that guy, Big Ben. Big Ben after playing really poorly early. Like yes. that's your, the, and even late on the comeback, down 16-13, he throws a perfect ball to James Conner for the game-winning touchdown. And he just drops it. And then he's able to, it looked like he threw a pick to end the game in the end zone, but then you saw it wasn't his fault at all. They were, uh, his receiver got pulled down by his face mask. And the, the, pl the game winning touchdown. That was not a quarterback sneak. That was a shovel pass. Yes. It was a called shovel pass and Ben. Called his, shovel pass. Also, the quarterback can run. Can run. And, yes. and Ben on the play, he sees the shovel pass in there, gets hit, and gets it across the goal line. But I do want to talk about this from the other team side the team that knocked Pittsburgh out of the playoffs last year. Why did Jacksonville not go to the Super Bowl last year? Because in the second half against New England, they tried to run out the clock instead of continuing to play. They got up 16-0 on Pittsburgh. They had four drives, three and out every time. Run up the middle, run up the middle, pass, punt. Run up the middle, sack, sack, punt. Run up the middle, run up the middle, pass, punt. Run up the middle, run up the middle, run up the middle, punt. It wasn't just that they were running. It was Leonard Fournette into the teeth of the, the defense every single time. The Steelers, I, I know they didn't have stuff on to it. Maybe the Jags thought this was their best path. But they, got, they were so afraid of Blake Bortles making the awful mistake that they gave Pittsburgh extra possessions. And Pittsburgh, you know, in, with four seconds left, wins the game. Can I just add one more to your list of three, mm -hmm. which is takeaways, is this Pittsburgh defense, which we all talked about coming into this season. If you had one concern with Pittsburgh, it's going to be their defense. You don't have Ryan Shazier. How are mm -hmm. they going to fill that role? Their defense has played really well for the last couple of weeks, and they yes. kept them in the game yesterday uh, until weeks. Roethlisberger mm -hmm. right, was able to um, put things together in the last uh, five minutes. The, see, the Steelers are now, in their last 16 road games, 14-1-1. The losses are an overtime loss, Chicago, and a loss, uh, the, or the, a tie, I should say, and a tie to Cleveland early in the year. Like, th that was the and that, that one loss and the one tie, they were all Mike Tomlin's fault, too. Right, <laughs> right. Well, that's, that's what I they was going to say. It's all the players on the wins that won and won, they were Tomlin's. Right, right. <laughs> uh, time now for Put a Grade on It, sponsored by CarMax. Ben Roethlisberger had an up-and-down day on Sunday, as we just mentioned. On the one hand, he threw three picks, and with the same hand, he threw for over 300 yards and ran in the game winner. CC, put a grade on Big Ben's day. I'm going to give him a B. And the reason why is because I always try to tell my kids and everything, the professor's going gi to gi give you a decent grade for just participating. If you show up and say, man, I'm here every day. I'm doing the best I can do. I'm trying. Like, it's not the best work. You know, I'm turning in pop quiz on me. I'm turning in C's and everything. But final exam, I did ace the final exam, and that brought me up to a B. So I'm, I'm Ben Roethlisberger, a B, because he stayed in there steady. And I said, you got to go to class, Nick, right? Right. Can't be sleeping in your room and he, everything. He had, he was failing up until the midterm and the final, and he did great on both of those. So I'm with you on the B. I can't give him. Little Ben name. was doing good. I, he was participating in class. He was there every day. He ain't the smartest student, no, Nick. No. Okay. I can't give him an A because of the things he mentioned, but what should be noted is this. The Steelers had no rushing game. 
James Conner, mm. nine carries for 25 yards. He had to throw the football, and early on, the Jacksonville defense was solving him. He made big plays late. The pass that James Conner dropped, the pa the run, the the touchdown pass we just showed. So that brings it up to a B. So both of you gave him a B. Mm -hmm. All right, sounds good. All right, take a break. Coming up, could Lamar Jackson be the long-term answer for the Baltimore Ravens, a quarterback? Next on First Things First. The Las Vegas Invitational tips off Thanksgiving Day here on FS1. First, number seven, North Carolina battles Texas. Then, number 20, UCLA takes on 11th ranking Michigan State. That, and we've got the big the game of the year in college football. This is Michigan, the one. Michigan, Ohio State. A little college basketball Jenna telling you about. A little football our graphics team's telling you about. Everything. I was going to get there eventually. What's, that What's sound, happening, see? see? Let's go, man. It's the week, man, of the game. Can't mess that up. You guys are going to hold that L, man. Time for stories to start your morning. Sponsored by Gillette Clear Joe. What a night from LeBron James. Scored 51 points in the Lakers' big win over the Heat. Just the 13th time LeBron has scored 50 in his career. It's shocking. Nick, what'd you make of his night? Well, I mean, he's just the 13th time. <laughs> that, that puts him sixth all time in 50 point games. Mm -hmm. Listen, I, LeBron, what I say last week, if LeBron's threes fallen, he gonna hit or your if he plus. scores a lot of points, look at the stat sheet and you'll see his three-pointer was yes. going down. Six of them last night, including one at the very end. Dad. Take that, Pat Riley, with your little spicy comments on my way out of town. That was a brilliant oh, game. Oh, this was a LeBron. message game, Jenna. You're also, 16. this could have been a horrible trip to Florida. They had lost to Orlando the night before. They're on a back-to-back. -back, and LeBron's got a little something for Pat Riley, and he gave it to him in the 51. You could see that he was sending a message. Back, back to the back. NFL now. Colts back, back. threw the doors off the Titans 38-10. to Andrew Locke had his seventh straight game with at least three touchdown passes. See, how impressed have you been? With Andrew Luck. Very impressed. And Jenna, you know I'm always matchmaking for you. I'm always trying to get you out on the stories with guys who are a great story. Jenna, That's it. this is another one of your guys. Him, Steph, yeah. Andrew Luck. I okay. mean, what they're doing with him, having him back playing football for this organization, because you talking about the difference between night and day. Andrew Luck, this guy is a legitimate star and it's hard to live up the height when Mel Kuyper tells you you're the best since um, Peyton Manning, Elway. Oh, my goodness. But it's great to see him. And yeah. Frank Wright, the coach there, yep. who was their second or third choice, man, you got to give him a lot of credit. Not surprising that Andrew Luck's great play, that streak, has coincided with a five-game streak of not being sacked. They have been able to – Quentin Nelson might be the rookie of the year as an offensive lineman. Personnel department, tremendous Absolutely. amount. Uh, of, of upgrade, on, especially on that offensive line. Cowboys beat the Falcons on a game-winning field goal. Ezekiel Elliott had over 200 yards from scrimmage and a touchdown. See, what would you make of Zeke's day? Oh, he's special now. And now they're starting to find a way, like they did in his rookie season, to get him to that second level. The offensive line, since Mark Colombo took over, is their new offensive line coach. You can see the improvement that they're making a lot more double teams at the line of scrimmage. He is a special, special player. You could see last night, I mean, yesterday afternoon, how explosive he was, though. He had, seemed like he had an extra little gear yesterday. So looking forward to seeing him on Turkey Day. He's got a chance to win the rushing title again. He wanted his rookie year. He could win it this year. The only reason I believe he didn't win it last year was the suspension. Yes. He has been the best runner of the football since he came into the league. Now, I, Gurley might be the better all-around back, but he's been the best guy to hand the ball off to since he came into the league. He was great. Incredible hair growth as well, oh, yeah. especially in the big last couple Big all head, big all hair. Cam Newton and the Panthers taking on the Lions. Down seven, a minute to go. Cam finds DJ Moore. In the end zone, Carolina decides, you know what? We're going to win this. We're going to go for two on the road. Cam Newton gets the ball. Plenty of time. Plenty of time to throw, but cannot connect with Jarius Wright. Panthers lose 20-19. to Here's head coach Ron Rivera on the decision to go for the win. Well, I think you go for two on the road to win the game. And that's what I did at the end of the day. What's to say the coin toss is going to go in our favor? What's to tell you we're going to stop them? So why not go for two? I was going for the win. That's just the bottom line. I wouldn't have won it any other way. He trusted in me, and I got to, I got to up him my end of the bargain, um, uphold my end of the bargain, and uh, I didn't do that. I let this team down, and I just got to be better. 
All right, Nick, I mean, we can't criticize coaches for playing too conservative and then also criticize them for being aggressive well, sure and aggressive. Sure, we can. Spots. That's, that's kind of half of sports television. We absolutely can. We I try can. not to. <laughs> it wouldn't <laughs> be fair. But it wouldn't right. be fair. <laughs> what, what about in this specific sense? What Ron uh, Rivera was faced with? All right, you've got to recognize that Rivera's post game comments, I do not think were honest. I think he was trying to protect his kicker. I do not think all things created equal, he goes for two there in every spot. I, and typically, even though I love being aggressive, if I think I have the better team, I don't want the game to come down to one play. And the Panthers are better than the Lions. But the reason, in my eyes, it was smart to go for two, that you should have gone for two, is Graham Gano, who hadn't missed a field goal all year, missed a field goal in this game of the exact length of an extra point and missed an extra point in this game. So I, I felt like if Graham Gano was maybe 75% to make that extra point, his confidence had been rattled. And by the way, the play design was great. You have it protected. You have a guy open. And Cam, it's a shame because he had played an awesome football game. Cam made a terrible play. He owned it afterwards, see? But, like, I got no – given the fact that Gano was having the worst game he's had with the Panthers, given the fact that you felt like you could get those yards, I don't mind them going for it. Cam just missed the throw. But do the players resent that, CC, when you know what your head coach is doing? Do the players say, well, that's not the, the right decision? Well, this is the thing. It was the right decision. Coaching philosophy has always been on the road, go for the win. If you're the home team, play for the tie because you have the home crowd and everything. Also, forget what the normal theory is. I have the best athlete that's ever played the position. It's hard for Ron Rivera to ever be wrong. He is the most dynamic two-way quarterback that's ever played this game. 99 years, 6'5", 245. All right? And if you have that guy, and if that guy can't get you the two-point conversion with the way he was playing, then you're in trouble. Cam, Cam has been playing some of the best football of his career from the pocket. And you could see they only rushed four, and their nose guard was almost like a spy. He didn't yep. rush at all. And he's the one that caused Cam problems. That's why Cam panicked at the last minute in his fundamentals. Watch his lead foot, his left leg. It steps out to his left and it didn't step to his target. That's why his ball sailed. It's also been one of Cam's problems throughout his career. He was great in this game, in the most critical moment. That's why your fundamentals are important, they and failed. it's hard to repeat them. And in that moment, he rushed and he jumped, didn't he step to it, his too. target and stick it on it. He knew, and afterwards, you could see the yep. growth. I knew a Cam Newton MVP of the league who couldn't finish answering questions at the Super Bowl. Yesterday, he did the right thing. Uh, listen, if there's going to be criticism of Ron Rivera, it, and people always go to the easiest possible criticism, this is what it should be. He didn't know if they were going for two before they scored the touchdown. They had two timeouts. They had two timeouts. They scored a touchdown with north of the one, about a minute seven left. It, you've got to know what we're doing. He knew Gano had missed those extra, the extra point in the field goal before that touchdown scored. You have to know, and your players have to know, if we score, we're going for it. Because in that situation... Because they burned a timeout. They burned a timeout to talk about it. In that situation, with two timeouts and over a minute left, even if you don't get it, you're going to get the ball back. Now, you're not going to have a lot of time, but you're going to have a shot. We've seen the Panthers win a game this year on a 60-plus yarder. Like, you're going to have you the ability. You need those timeouts. You need those timeouts. Yeah. I don't think it's that important that the players know you're going to go for two. I think it's more important that the players is a constant philosophy of what the organization and what the teams and how they're going to play. When you get off the bus on a given day, what's going to be our philosophy? What's going to be our theme? What are we going to do? And there's a reason why Ron Rivera got the name, Riverboat Ron. It's because he has decided to gamble and go for it. And this was not, to me, it was not a big, big gamble. So it's not that important that the players know on the last drive. It's not that important. It's important that our philosophy stays consistent and that we're going to be aggressive. All right. Let's move on to the Ravens. They debuted their first-round pick in this year's draft yesterday. Lamar Jackson making his first start for the injured Joe Flacco. The rookie beat the Bengals yesterday 24-21. I'd say it's a good start. He threw for 150 yards, rushed for a buck 17 on 27 carries. Baltimore now sits at 5-5. Five and five. Here is Lamar on his first win. I'm a rookie. My first time starting to just go out there and be myself. You know, my teammates had my back. I had theirs. I thought he played very poised. I thought he played 
I thought he played the, the position. I thought he played quarterback very well. Uh, uh, managed us, operated us, got us in the right formations. Uh, Cadence was excellent. You know, for a first time out rookie in, a, in an environment like that, to have the, all those operational things go well, I think speaks to his intelligence, his, his study, his studiousness, uh, just his ability to run the show. And that, that's, uh, that says everything. Now, after that, the playmaking, you know, that comes from God. See, I, I watched this whole game. I was anxious to see how he was going to do. You talked so much about Lamar Jackson coming out of the draft. We hadn't really seen so much of him, especially in a position yeah. like this. If he was nervous, you didn't see too much of it. He looked like he handled himself pretty well. What were your impressions of Lamar Jackson? Uh, Lamar Jackson is good to win. Um, I, I thought that this was Christmas served early as far as the Bengals and their defense. They were going to help him um, playing professional football. And we have seen all the other quarterbacks. You go top to bottom. Baker. Down to him. Five of them drafted in first, and we thought all of them would start at some point. All of them had, and all of them have had tremendous struggles along the way. That's what the National Football League should be about, and we've seen it. And he struggled throwing the ball. He struggled reading some coverages. They had a very, very simple, simple game plan, and they were successful in winning this game. No problem. But he won't have no long career running that ball 27 times because he does not have the body. Now, he can, um, Harbaugh can say, oh, his guy given ability that with his quickness and build, um, and to build with his all overall speed. But no, you cannot design that many runs the way they did in this game. I can understand getting through the first game, but for any of the quarterbacks, and we just talked about Cam Newton, 6'5, 245. Man, Lamar, man, he is not that. So they have to design something. Congratulations. Welcome to the NFL. Good win at home against the poorest defense that we have in the NFL. But they have to be able to change the game plan moving forward or he's going to have some serious health problems. See, you just said Cam is the most physically gifted quarterback in NFL history. Yes. The best at what dual threat quarterback we've seen. And body. And well, Right. And Cam's career high, career high in carries is 17. He had 27 yesterday. The NFL record. Lamar. Lamar. The NFL record post-merger was 22. That was Tim Tebow, and he wasn't a quarterback. He was an H-back trying to play quarterback, and they knew he had to run the football, and Tebow, to his credit, did have the body. Tebow had a fullback's body. Like, Tebow, mm -hmm. you, you were worried about Tebow throwing the ball. You weren't that worried right. about Tebow getting hurt. Mm -hmm. Like, the, it was the Ravens can win like this, and they maybe even can steal a wild card spot playing like this. But this is not what is sustainable for Lamar's career. This is, he wouldn't, the, there's a reason that going into the draft, people weren't saying maybe he should play running back. They were saying maybe he should play wide receiver. Now, he said, I can't catch that silly. I've always been a quarterback. But guys like that don't play running back. They don't have 20-plus carries in a football game. I give him a ton of credit, and I understand that the Ravens didn't know they, which of three quarterbacks were going to start. So they had to have a simple game plan. They had to try to win. They, they were in they, Their season was falling apart. They, they went from 3-1 and one to 4-5, and five, and they had to get a win. But this has to change immediately if he's going to have any type of long-term success. If he's, if he's good enough to win as a dual threat, maybe it's one game, maybe it's a game and a half. Is he good enough to win just throwing the ball? Do the Ravens have a good enough line? Do they have good enough protection? Why, do they have a good enough team around him where if he wasn't going to run the ball 27 times, he could still win? Oh, no. There's a reason why he was drafted at the end of the first round. I mean, his throwing motion is not pure. He's inconsistent. You can see sometimes he throws the ball sidearm, and he's height challenged a little bit. He's probably like 6'1", you know, so Baker Mayfield probably a little bit taller than him. So, no, you can't. He, he, no, he is a hybrid quarterback, and you have to develop a system for a hybrid. He's not a drop back, but he's also he's not a 27 carry a game guy. Michael Vick who was a better runner with the football than him and has a better body than he had. It took him uh, four games as a rookie to reach 27 carries. So, no, you have to come up with a system to be able to take advantage of both. It can't be too much of either. Right. Too much in the pocket, and it definitely can't be like it was yesterday. Vic, Vic's career high in carries was 15. Like, this is, people <laughs> just got to understand what they were seeing, that this was an outlier of outliers. Again, if, he, if they had rushed him 15 times, it would be top five most times since the merger. Like, they rushed him 27. They, they rushed him almost double that. And so, I, I, I under, the Ravens, by the way, they have a great defense. They have an excellent rushing attack, even absent of Lamar. The kid yesterday, Ed, Gus Edwards, who he had he had a great game to go along with mm -hmm. Lamar Jackson. So I understand what they're doing, but for him, this is 
it's it, this has to be a one-time thing. Like the next game, it, the carries have to be cut more than in half. And now maybe with oh, knowing he's going to be the starter with a week to prepare, that's what they'll do. And he also, you mentioned how bad the Bengals' defense has been. That has mostly been their pass defense, and he wasn't able to fully take advantage of it. So I, I'm happy for Lamar because he was, I thought, unfairly scrutinized before the draft. They got to win. They're right. 500. Maybe it'll be his job the rest of the way. But he's got to be more sore this morning than he has at any point in his football career. And so he, I, you can't do this weekend. Did you see RG3 come in for the one play? Mm -hmm. He got excited and he came out with the finger off, and it was nice to see him at least. See On the field, game for yep. sure. Mm -hmm. All right, coming up are the Saints, far and away the best team in the league. That's next on First Things First. Welcome back to First Things First. Welcome to the show. Our favorite guest, former NFL head coach, Eric Mangini. Good What's going morning. on, coach? Good morning. Nice to see you. Love Three in a row, here. Jenna. <laughs> yeah, that's right, Nick. Keep Three guests in a row. Let's she has called talk our favorite less guest. and think more. You actually are my favorite, favorite guest. in the moment. That's in, not what yeah. she said. Thanks. Let's talk about the Saints because the Saints are really <laughs> good. I swear I did not mean to say please, that. Please do the highlight, Jenna. I swear that's not what I meant. <laughs> Mr. Tickles, let me have your job. <laughs> the uh, Saints played what looked like like uh, a JV opponent yesterday in the Philadelphia Eagles and boy they beat him handily 48 to 7 we're moving on uh, for the Saints their ninth win in a row Drew Brees continued his MVP campaign throwing for 363 yards four touchdowns on the other side not nearly as nice Wentz through three picks, just 156 yards as Philly falls to four and six now on the season. Their worst loss ever by a defending Super Bowl champion. Here is Saints quarterback Drew Brees on the big win. We do come out with a lot of confidence because we know the amount of preparation that, that has gone into that. So um, each and every time we touch the ball, we feel like we're going to make the plays, right? We, that we have a good game plan and that hey, all of a sudden adjustments need to be made. Hey, we've... We, we know how to make those. Um, you know, we know where our matchups are. We know, um, you know, I, I think there's just, there's just a lot of confidence that goes into, um, you know, each and every time we get the ball, you know, what do we need to do to put points on the board this drive? You know, I've played a lot of football games in my career uh, ever since I was a kid, and this is one of the, the worst losses I've ever been a part of. And, um, yeah, it's frustrating. It's frustrating all the way around, offensively, defensively, special teams. We just got beat. Plain and simple, we got beat. I got to be better, and it starts with me, um, especially offensively. I have to get that thing going earlier and, and early and often. We talk about it all the time, and uh, we just haven't gotten, been able to get it fixed. So, um, yeah, it was definitely a frustrating one today, but at the end of the day, um, we're going to get out of here. We're going to watch this film, and uh, we're going to go uh, play a couple of NFC East opponents here and, and see what we're made of. It's about as half full as Carson Wentz can make that glass. Coach, you look at the Saints, you want to say, are they the best team in the league? But you have to factor in who they played yesterday and how that team played yesterday. Yeah, when, when, when you're dealing with the Saints, it, it's difficult because there's so many things offensively that they can do. So it's, it's the shifting, it's the motioning, it's the multiple personnel groups, it's the different formations. And, and then you heard Drew Brees talk about their understanding of what the defense is doing and, and their ability drive to drive to come off the field and say, okay, this is where we need to attack next. Combine that with two running backs that are, are complementary that they can put in it and, and really not skip a beat with, with either guy but affect the defense totally different ways based off of their styles. It, it makes it incredibly difficult. So that part is challenging defensively they're getting better you know Eli Apple's playing better than he had been playing he mm -hmm. the, the, the system wise it looks like they're, they're getting more and more comfortable playing together now they also have the advantage of typically playing with a lead or knowing that they can take some chances because they're going to score so many points I'd say the other thing that's underrated is, is Mike Westhoff went there about mid-year last year he's a special teams coach mm -hmm. and he was my special teams coach in New York he's really really good at what he does but he's also a great sounding board he he, he provides a, a level of insight and experience that can help any head coach regardless of how many years they've been there and, and I don't think the special teams play really gets talked about enough and that gives him an, another significant edge every play with the Saints especially from a special teams with Mike Westall 
and offensively, it's so intense because it can be an explosive play. They're trying to attack you, special teams-wise. Mike Westoff and Tyson Hill, the quarterback extraordinaire at BYU, <laughs> like that Sean Payton is in love with. So every time they can get the, his hands on the football in the offense, so it, it's special to see. Um, also, from a defensive standpoint, after 10 games, you can say what you want about the numbers. But the numbers would say this is the number one rush defense. And the reason why is because, man, Drew Brees and them get the lead on you. So they don't, Dennis Allen, that defense, they only have to defense a certain amount. So they're going to play a lot of nickel defense. They're going to take you out of the running game because what their offense and the threat. So now, how good do you have to be in this NFL defensively? You have to be decent on third down, and you got to be decent in, in, um, in the red zone. And if you don't give up those big chunk plays, you don't have to be a great defense when you have the type of quarterbacks and throwing. So I, I think the Saints, this is something that is sustainable. I, th I do think that they are the most dangerous team in the NFC because I believe this style for which they adopted last year, they're one of the few teams that I see some carryover. The only reason why they weren't playing Philly for the NFC Championship was because the miracle that happened there in Minneapolis. I think people forget how their season ended Absent that first game, Tampa yeah. Bay, where they got Fitz Magic, man, they have continued from what they were doing in 17 over to 18, is which is very, very rare in the NFL. Man, it's hard to blow teams out in this league. It's even harder yes. to blow out desperate defending champion teams. This is the worst loss a defending Super Bowl champion has ever suffered, points-wise. This was it, it, yesterday all day long. Every game's a one-score game. Every game except for the Colts game. Yeah, right. The Colts beat the brakes off the Titans, and the Saints molly -whopped the Eagles. Hey, Traquan Smith, we, we're not so comfortable with our number two receiver. So uncomfortable bringing Des Bryant, then bringing Brandon Marshall. Traquan Smith, best day of his career. Ten catches, a buck 57, yes. and a touchdown. Drew Brees completed 73% of his passes and lowered his career or his season completion percentage. I, the, the Saints, the Saints, if they had an average quarterback, they would have a pretty good offense given their running game. If they had no running game, they would have a pretty good offense given their quarterback. When you put them together, there are no right answers to this test that the Saints are giving. And they are putting themselves in position to where they're not going to have to deal with the X factor of, oh, my God, it's a snowstorm and windy. They're not going to have to deal with pouring rain. Like, they keep winning. Everything goes through the perfect conditions of the Mercedes Superdome. And that nobody wants to go there right now. We got to talk about the other side and what's going on with the Eagles. I mean, where do you start? Start with their secondary. Breeze through touchdown passes to Carr, Smith, Thomas Kamara, and my friends Marcy and Marnie <laughs> all in one game. It was kind of impressive. He had their way with them. I, I don't know when you look at this Eagles team, where, where you can, I mean, I guess Carson Wentz is doing okay, but everywhere else. And the Carson Wentz wasn't good. And Carson good. Wentz yesterday was not good. How shocking is it that they have had such a severe and, and drastic drop-off from last year, Coach? It, it's not that shocking. I talked about it in the preseason. I've talked about it all season. When, you, when you're in that oh, position. Oh, Coach, you talked about how fun it was there. He, he, he was like, watch and see this year. We'll, we'll see how much fun, fun, fun that they're going to be having. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's no conga lines at this point. They're not taking <laughs> shots at the Patriots. And, and look, it's, it's legitimately something that you have to teach your team how to deal with. And we say it all the time. De deal with adversity. Everybody, everybody spends time on that. Yes. Dealing with success, understanding how to, how to handle success the right way, that's not an easy skill to master either. And you have to be able to if you want to be able to have sustained success. And, and, and every team they play is taking their best shot. Even yesterday, the Saints go for it on fourth and seven and throw a touchdown. It's a little bit of that... Oh well, yeah. yeah, it's a little little poking. Oh yeah, Malcolm little... Jenkins gets up and flips the bird to to Sean Tom Payton. He was like, "Yeah, hey, how's that Super Bowl crown? How is that defending that Super Bowl championship?" I told you guys there would be problems this season based on the the organization. They got all types of championship stuff in the locker room, trying to duplicate the previous season success in the NFL is harder than any of the other sports. That's why it's very, very rare to repeat. And I think that your stories are so refreshing as far as the time New England. When did they miss the playoffs? When did they struggle? It was after their first success and what you went through and, and not knowing you were like, we did not know. And we, man, learned so much 
in our failure more so than we did in our success. And, and they may end up just like we did. We, we ended up 9-7 and seven that season. We missed the playoffs, the, the whole division at that point. The Jets were 9-7, and seven, the, the uh, Dolphins were 9-7, and seven, and, and the Jets went to the playoffs based off the tiebreaker. It could be the same thing in their division, or they could put, potentially sneak into the playoffs, you know, depending how this all shakes out. But it's, it's this, this journey that you take after winning the Super Bowl that's uncharted waters for, for everybody involved. Here's what's so disappointing to me about Philly is they had a perfect line of demarcation in their season where it could have gone one of two different ways. They're in London against Jacksonville at a disappointing three and four. They get that win. You got that six-hour plane ride back and then your bye week to say, hey, Everything guys were saying who have won championships was true. It's We can't just roll the ball out. It is a different team. But despite all of that, we're one game back in our division. Washington at the time was dealing with all their injuries on their offensive line. We come out this next week against a wounded Cowboys team, get a win. We control everything. We can put the first half of the year behind us. And they came out the next week against Dallas and got beat three separate times in that football game. And then this week didn't even put up a fight against the Saints. Like, like, these couple weeks were a chance to get them back on the other track, and they went the other yeah, way. It's impossible. I don't care where you go. You can go in outer space. But if you got a bad offensive line, you got a bad secondary, you're not going to win the NFL. So going to London didn't cure that. It's only, you know, over the bye week what it did, people start looking at it, and they're starting to exploit. That offensive line, they are going after the quarterback, taking them immediately out of the running game, and everyone's going after the sac- sa- uh, after secondary. their secondary, and even Malcolm Jenkins. The only starter that they have remaining, man, it, this is way, this is life in the NFL when you're at the top of the hill. And it's not going to change. People are going to keep taking their best shot yeah. through the rest of the season. All right, let's take a break. Coach, stick around. Coming up, how was Pittsburgh able to steal a win yesterday? That's next on First Things First. Back here with Coach Mangini, we are going viral. Old Beckham Jr. had 74 yards and a touchdown in the Giants' 38-35 win over the Bucks on Sunday. No one happier than this fan who got to take home an OBJ souvenir. Man. Ah! <sighs> There were five kids around that guy no that I think that Odell was tossing the ball to, and my man just snatched it. Look He's at that guy. He's happier excited. than any of those kids. That's the way I was after the game of the Sixers, man, getting Jimmy Butler's shoes. Man, the people was like, ah, you're going to get some kids? Man, get off of me. <laughs> I'm getting to play in these Jays, man. Take out his orthotics and everything. I was at the Sixers game. <laughs> and as no shame, when did, had you met Jimmy Butler before? Yes. You, oh, okay, my apologies. Yeah, I sat in his suite for the Super Bowl. He was up there drinking oh, some expensive wine and everything. Oh, yeah, thing. Nick, what do you think? I just was born in my first show. No, I you understand. You think I just got to the rodeo? I understand. I but rode some horses in this show and everything. Jimmy Butler's like, yo, bro. Let me, I said, let me get them shoes. He was like, of course. Legend, okay. of course. Whatever else you need. You need gear. That's what he said. What do you want me to do, bro? I mean, I've been places before in life. I just didn't get here. Coach, what do you want me to do? I was just like that guy right there. Let me get them Jays. These kids, they got a long life to live. Back off. <laughs> Boom, get back off of me. That little boy over to the left there, he's traumatized. Yes, Look exactly. At just, he just can't figure out how that dude snatched it Snatched from the ball. Yeah. If you look closely, you can figure it out. Back to uh, Big Ben and the Steelers. <laughs> Steelers Whoa. Trying to make it six wins in a row. Taking on the team that, for whatever reason, has their number in the Jaguars. Big Ben threw three picks, including that, that one in the end zone. Just like Jim. To Jalen Ramsey. See, Steelers <laughs> down, 16-0. Then the comeback. Here we go. Down three, less than a minute to go. Roethlisberger connects with Antonio Brown, who takes it down to the two. Eight seconds left. Big Ben runs it in for the touchdown. Steelers go on to win. Jags have now lost six in a row. 20 to 16 was your final. Here's Ben Roethlisberger after the game on the comeback. We just never quit, you know, and that, that's what's kind of special about this group is we're going to fight to the end, and we literally fought to the end. Against a defense that's let, you know, they make their feelings known, how did it feel for you to get the last lap in this case? Well, they're, they're a really good defense. Like I said, they, they like to talk a lot uh, before the game, during the game, um, but I'm, I'm carrying the game ball home. <laughs> Not as much after the game, before and during especially. Coach, what did the Steelers show you in their win yesterday? To me, they've been consistent throughout throughout the year, and they've been consistent over the years, or Ben has, where he can go out and, and throw three interceptions, but he's resilient, and, and they're resilient. And whenever you 
start to rule the Steelers out. Whenever you think that they're finally that they're finally out of it or they're buried, they come back and, and they show you that, that they can Coach, win. Coach, I don't win. find many people, and I, and I don't mean to cut you off, I, I don't find many people who analyze this game on a regular basis, though, through the years, that is consistent with the Pittsburgh Steelers like you. Because the Pittsburgh Steelers, even though they're not, they're, they're not consistent. And they got a different function. And, and you've taught us different families got a different vibe, and they got different rules that apply to them of how they're going to move forward. And you've made me clear, and I've been a Steelers fan because I'm about organizations and I'm about um, head coaches and empowering them. And that's what the Pittsburgh Steelers do as well as anyone. But, man, you've taught me so much about Pittsburgh and how they do business. And, man, you even when I tend to, man, I'm getting ready to lose faith. You're like, this is how they do things. And, and, and why is that? Because playing against them for as long as we did and as many times either playing against Ben directly or, or, or dealing with the organization as a whole, I've seen it over and over again where you think, okay, that now it's a down year. Now Ben's, Ben's really reached a point where, where he's not going to be able to come back. But his resilience, he, it rolls off his back, and he goes out the next drive, and he, and he plays that drive like every other drive didn't exist. And, and that is a tremendous trait for anybody to have. But for your quarterback to have, it's, it's fantastic. And everybody else around him knows. So you're sitting on that sideline, all right, Ben threw three picks. All right, now we'll go win the game. And I think there's that, that mentality there. And I think that filters down from the quarterback. I also think it filters down from the coach. And we last week we talked a lot about Doug Peterson's press conferences and how they've been this message and this message and that he's kind of learning on the fly. Other than Belichick, who's consistent in the press conference in a very droll, monotonous way, nobody is as consistent with their facial expression, their tone of voice, their message, win or lose in the press conference is Mike mm -hmm. Tomlin. Like, he is very clear. We He's always going to use one of his lines of, nice to escape here with a win in the national football. Like, you know what you're going to get from him, and mm -hmm. his players know that. And that's one of the reasons why you had said previously, see, the Steelers were a different team away from Heinz Field. For the last couple years, Years, they're now 14 1 and 1 in their last 16 road games the the tie and the loss both in overtime one to the Bears and the one Browns earlier like it to have that type of success on the road given all the drama surrounding the team be it player suspensions holdouts things like that that is a testament to Mike Tomlin and no coach lost a player a top flight all pro player like Pittsburgh lost this week none this this week like no, the coaches even, you know how humiliating that must be for Mike Tomlin, one of the best coaches that's ever coached this game as an African-American. He's texting one of his star players. He's trying to call him, and the player's not responding? Like, not even giving him no feedback? And then he's got to go to the media and be like, you know something, we're getting ready to move on. The Pittsburgh Steelers weren't a better team this week after L. Bell. Right. No, there was no team that faced it. And I would say even what Washington faced yesterday, losing their quarterback as far as, um, you know, Alex Smith. Like, that, that, that's, a, that's a bad injury. That's what Pittsburgh went through this week. And that's what Mike Tomlin has, uh, has dealt with year after year. How do I get through some type of adversity? How do I get through that? And he had a very, very tough week. And he stood up there like an NFL head coach is supposed to do and had very good talking, consistent message points for his team and for his fan base. All right, so as good as the Steelers have been, it makes what happened yesterday all the more confusing. If there was ever a team in the last two years that have had the Steelers number, it's got to be the Jaguars, who are not playing good football, but somehow all except for the last five minutes yesterday own the Steelers I, and last year I, as well. I think it speaks to the importance of Antonio Brown and the Steelers offense because clearly nobody gives him fits the way Jalen does. Jalen is a tremendous football player. I know we talk about the comments and right now he's having to eat a lot of those comments and if the trade rumors are true he might have to go play on a team with one of the quarterbacks he trashed because the odds are I mean most of the quarterbacks in the league well, are on that, that list. One that he did trash beat him yesterday. Right. Yeah. Abs absolutely but like and Jalen got beat on a couple plays late but I think that what they are able to do in the secondary against the Steelers that's been the secret sauce to Jacksonville but the flip side of that is Jacksonville is so terrified in big games of Blake Bortles killing them that in the second, once they got up 16-0, four straight three and outs, 
First down on every single drive, a run up the middle. Second down on three of the four drives, a run up the middle. They And they punted every single time. They 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 did not want to let Bortles make a mistake, and it gave the Steelers too many extra chances. Well, but look, look, in fairness to them, though, they ran the ball, what, nine times in a row to start the game. They were running the ball very effectively. Only two things happened. You, you're right, Coach. Keep going. Only and, and, and they play, they, they were playing really good defense. They had intercepted Ben three times. So so for them— And they it, only had a 16-point lead. Yeah, they, it, but, but the, from a consistent— conservative standpoint you could see why they would think okay if we run the ball which we've done well the, the entire game and we play good defense we're going to get out of this okay no I'm sh that, that's why instead of putting it in Bortles hands and potentially make a mistake to lose the game they wanted to make the Steelers beat them and unfortunately the Steelers were able to and there was only two things that Pittsburgh had to make the adjustments to stop stop them on the first down run and stop them from the check downs to the running back that's all they had to take away from. So it's, it, it's easy when we've seen it to place the blame on Jacksonville. Oh, they got conservative. There was only two things they were doing. Run the ball on first down, and the quarterback was dropping back, looking way down the field, and checking it down to the running back, and the running back was making the linebackers miss. So it wasn't as if they had to make wholesale changes to be able to slow down this offense that's not very, very explosive. And, and they didn't really get conservative. They were conservative the from, from the very start. They just didn't adjust Yeah, this wasn't that. a New England game. Yeah, no. All right, Coach, we'll see you a little bit later on. Coming up, talk some basketball. LeBron put on a show in Miami. That's next. First things first. An NFL football Thanksgiving feast will be served up on Fox as bitter NFC rivals battle. It's Adrian Peterson of Washington taking on Ezekiel Elliott and the Cowboys. And it all starts at 4 Eastern on Fox. All of a sudden, that's the game of the year on the NFC East. Thanksgiving Day, that's awesome. Time now for us to go viral. Kyler Murray's putting together a Heisman caliber season and with the junior QB also being drafted to play baseball for the athletics, the Bo Jackson comparisons are unavoidable with Murray Payne homage himself recreating oh, Bo Jackson's gee. famous <laughs> photo shoot minus one thing like 30 pounds of girth. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Ain't nothing wrong with that. You got to pack the groceries some kind of way. Go ahead, Kyler. All right. Now, listen, there's only one Bo Jackson. Correct. All right. And God, when he got done with him, said, I'm going to take a break for a while. <laughs> Next Bo Jackson going to come in a shorter package. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, you, that's a tough comparison to be able to live up to. But, man, outstanding. Kyler Murray's supposed to be a far better baseball player than Bo was. Kyler Murray, what they expect. Yes, at least as a prospect now. Yes. Who Bo Jackson became and everything, because Bo only played a little bit of college baseball there at Auburn, but he did play college baseball compared to Dion, who didn't play college baseball. Yep. We don't have much of that anymore. We used to have, we used to see it a lot. We'd see. Yeah, the parents are all screwed up and everything, making these kids specialize in everything. Yep. All right, we'll get to LeBron in a second, but it's first. It's the parents, Jenna, you know. Yeah, I know. Yeah, because my girls are going to be dual sport athletes. Yeah, you're the one holding them back. Lines wide out. Kenny Galladay diving backwards makes a great touchdown grab. You like the way he's playing this year, Nick? Yeah, listen, he's to me one of the surprise young wide receivers that's burst onto the page this year. I didn't expect any, like, he, he's one of the reasons they felt they could move on from Golden State. A absolutely. Great point there, Nick. And it's also, they're starting to highlight him more week in and week out. You see him in the game plan, and Stafford here likes throwing to him. That's a great catch. Good young player. Great Very catch. Very difficult. All right, Cowboys and Falcons. Matt Ryan overthrows Julio Jones. So Julio has to turn into a defender against safety Jeff Heath. I mean, the instant recognition of trying to go from tracking the ball to catch it to then turning into the best safety on the Falcons, that was a great play. And I'm glad Julio moved his helmet to the side. His football fundamentals, he didn't go helmet to helmet because he could have easily collision him, right? Helmet to helmet Ooh. there. You can see him take the helmet to the side. All the football players are adjusting, but good defensive move. Once you know you can't catch the ball, you're immediately you're a defensive player. Steelers and Jags, Jalen Ramsey had quite a day but it folded into a bad loss. Here he overpowers Antonio Brown for a second interception of the game. This is a special play on so many levels. Not only does he read where they're going, not only does he play great bump and run, but he's able to finish it with an unbelievable catch. He's a 
There's not five better athletes than Jalen, old spicy mouth in the NFL. And you could see yesterday why his mouth's so spicy because he can back it up. And it, Hashtag it, spicy mouth. It got called back, but he returned this 40 yards. Oh, yeah, yeah. Got up and ran. He was Antonio touchdown. made a great play by touching him yep. right there. Uh, he's spectacular, man. He can talk all he wants. He's great. He's not the problem with Jacksonville. Not lost Speaking on a great. football Monday. A tremendous performance by LeBron James. He scored 51 points in the Lakers 113-97 win over the Heat. It was the first time LeBron has won in Miami since leaving after the 2014 season. Just the 13th time LeBron has scored 50 in his career. He's now done it for three different teams. Lakers are now 9-7 and seven on the year. Nick... I don't know if you caught this game. Uh, has LeBron flipped the switch earlier than you expected him to do? Well, the last week he has. It has, listen, his three's been falling. It's unbelievable what's happened with him in three-point range. First half dozen games of the year, shooting 20%. The last 10 games, 50% from three on six a game. The highest volume of his career, shooting 50%, to which has brought his season total up to about 40. What up, yeah, you, you know the reason why he went for this 51, though, Nick? Well, go ahead. Yeah, because I was there. Well, you... No, you weren't. Yes, I was. I'm going to be so mad at you. No, I was there. Sure. So you went You went to the Philly game. On Friday, on Friday night. Friday yes, night. Absolutely. And then a little Miami. private jet with your, with your rich folks. Well, yeah, I didn't have to say that, but okay, I, I, I ended up that. getting there. Yes. Uh -huh. And you stayed for this game, and then what, you took the red eye here this morning? No, I was just in Florida. Oh, okay. I, knew, oh, I wasn't at the game. Yeah, you a damn lot. <laughs> no, he did this for somebody else. <laughs> this, is, this is, and as Jenna <laughs> said, this is... The first time he's won in this building since he was wearing a Miami Heat uniform. Yeah, the win was important, but Nick, why did he have to get 51? Though? Well, I think he was sticking Come on, it to tell Pat Riley a little, little bit. Something, something because, Riley. listen, he had a monster first quarter. He had 42 through three. And then in the fourth quarter, the I didn't know if he was going to play in the fourth quarter. But the backups on the Lakers let Miami back in the game. Yes. So LeBron had to go back in. And then when it was decided late, oh, LeBron was looking for a shot. LeBron was gunning late. He wanted to get that 51. He scored He scored his 48th point with about 50 seconds left to where they were going to have to take one more shot, and he did this. He waited, he waited, he waited right in your eye. But I want people to understand, appreciate what we're watching. In NBA history, year 15 or later, here are the 50-point games. One by Carl Malone, three by LeBron, mm -hmm. and the last game of Kobe's career. The 60 points on 50. Wait, wait, say, say that one more time. That's the full year, That's 15, it? year 15 or later. I mean, because we've had a lot of the great players play for a long time. Kareem, we, Malone, Kobe, obvious. So, Carl Malone did it once in year 15. LeBron's done it three times now. Once in the regular season in year 15. Once in the finals in year 15. And once last night in year 16. And the only other one, the only other 50-point game in year 16 or later was the Kobe Bryant Memorial game, the final game of his career where he took 50 shots and scored 60. So this doesn't happen. Like, prior to this year, C, LeBron was a consensus top three all-time guy with a career yes. average of 27, 7, and 7. In year 16, he's given you 29, 8, and 7. I don't know how he's getting better. I don't know how this is still happening. I don't know how he all of a sudden became a high-volume, high-percentage three-point shooter. But he has, and the Lakers need it right now. Because they, And that was, I know, your question, Jenna. Like, Lonzo has lost himself. Ingram can't score more than 20 to save his life. Like, they need it right now. LeBron, like all the others that's on this list, all these players were special offensive players. All of them relied on their athleticism and or their body from the top. Kareem, he's just, a, I mean, at that mm -hmm. size, he was a phenomenal athlete. Carl Malone, Michael Jordan, like all these players. But LeBron has the rarest of combination because he has the best body and he has one of the top skill sets. So he can post up. He can shoot the three. He can still be athletic and play above the rim. And that's what you were able to see in the 51. He went through an arsenal. Right. Oh, I can post up like Kareem. Oh, I can still raise above it like Jordan. Oh, I can step beyond that with the three-pointer. So this is a skill set that we hadn't seen. So it's still, it's still awesome to see him work. And I don't mind, Nick, not, not at this point, because I used to be like, he know he can do that. He can go for 50 more like Kobe, more like Jordan. But he's special that you know when he decides to go for it, 
and that three-pointer is going, these are the type of nights that he can still produce. But listen, th this is – in no way am I saying the Lakers are anything like the Cavs last year, but do you worry at all that, that if LeBron gets – to the point where he's so frustrated with how this Lakers team is playing that he is just going to treat it like the Cavs well, and say, well, let me just I, let listen, me just take over for the rest of the way? I, I I like watching this version of LeBron. I said this last year with the Cavs. The benefit to having the Cavs be as bad as they were last year, we got some vintage, like, year six LeBron performances where it's like the only way we're going to win is if I do everything, I'm going to have to have the ball. Yes. It's fun. More it fun. was special. Right. It, it's the same. Like Now, it's not the best – basketball to see no I mean because LeBron he's really special when he's around 30 to 33 and about 13 to 15 assists mm -hmm. about eight nine rebounds like that's but if you force him that's the greatness force it out of force it out of him and and, and he will make and this sometimes it's it's forced by his teammates and because last night's game was a sneaky important game yes because the Lakers had won four in a row they were feeling great and they laid an egg in Orlando. Oh, oh. They were they had a great first quarter. Didn't and, unpack their defense. And then uh, got outscored by 15 in the second quarter. Got beat in the third quarter to where the starters didn't even play in the fourth. It was to, and if all of a sudden you go to Florida and lose to Orlando and Miami in back-to-back -back games, it undoes so much of the positive momentum they had going. But to your point about the Cavs, like there are real concerns for the Lakers. I Brandon Ingram, I'm I'm told is a score. That's what he does well. He has scored, see, more than 26 points one time since high school. That's concerning. Wow. That's It's concerning to me that he has one 32-point game, and other than that, his high since high school is 26. Lonzo turning into a spot-up shooter. That's concerning to me. I'm not worried that LeBron might have to go to this because he seems to be the only... Apologies early for the word use. Indefatigable athlete we've ever seen. Can't be tired. Like he, seen, like he just can do this for however long he needs to do he this. He could have also said tireless, mm -hmm. but he'd Tire rather said indefatigable. Indefatigable, like that's that better. Uh, but they don't I do charge wanna... no extra for the word. They don't charge no matter how many how many vowels nope. and consonants you put in. They don't nope. charge no. They, they just nope. a monthly fee. Nope. Just want for that fake wants, wants, wants them to they know. They got someone watching the show too counting. Indefatigable. That's his word of the week. Okay, real quick. On a Monday. Okay, it, real bring quick it around. before Full we, circle, before we finish. I remember early in the year, the story was LeBron's not playing great. I, I even said he was waiting to ten really days. First 10 up. days of the First season. First 10 days. Okay, everyone, when they get a chance, go check the NBA.com stats. LeBron James right now, second in the league in points per game. Second to a guy in Steph, who's been great, but has now missed a third of the season. Second in the league in player mm -hmm. efficiency rating. Second to Steph, a guy who's missed a third of the season. LeBron yep. only now gearing up. He's been, if you consider the fact that Steph's been hurt, he's been the best player in the league this year without playing great the first 10 days. And on definitely going to get player of the month in November. A couple more games, get that player of the month. Then next thing you know, we're in the conversation for mm -hmm. Mr. MVP. At this age, that would be one of them trinkets, Nick, where I can bring out that special math. Mm -hmm. Like you like to bring out those special words and stuff, the word right. club. Those you know, I got that words. math from Ohio and everything. Mm -hmm. He got like two championships for yeah, the one in yeah. Cleveland. Yeah, yeah there get... we go. Yeah, How much a month you paying? Oh, what is that? that? Huh? What is that? club. W word, word club. Yeah, I saw it. I saw it in your wallet, your little word club card and everything. All right. Give him a little sticker every First time First of all, I'm it. not in the word club. Second nice. of all, if I were, I would not invite Chris. Season pass. <laughs> it's you. Um, you and baby girl. We're going to study this in a commercial so break. Back good. after this. First, we're going viral. First round pick, Lamar Jackson. Made his starting round, starting debut yesterday, throwing for 150 yards, rushing for another 117 on 27 carries in his, his first career win. And Lamar almost forgot his souvenir, chasing down the ref to get his game ball back for keepsake. Oh, let me see this. I haven't seen this. Oh, yeah. He got skills now. Watch this. Oh. Watch him. Oh, up from behind. Boop. Let me have that. Oh. <laughs> That's great. Oh, yeah. He, he from down there in South Florida. I don't think that's the first time he ever took something and ran. Oh, right? come, oh, don't do that to what Lamar. What up, homie? What up, homie? Don't do that to Lamar. You know, look, we just passed Halloween, man. We talked about snatching a little bag. Watch it. Oh, come up. Oh, let me get that. Hey, how you doing? How you doing? First win. First win. That was cute. I like that. I like a guy having, in this interview afterwards, man. He was having fun. Big moment. First time starting and winning the NFL game. Excited for him.
excited for him. Now, just don't rush him 27 times the next three games combined, Baltimore. Jenna. Jenna. Explain to America what his body feels like today after all 27 car crash he was in yesterday. Not great. That ain't great. Little beat up. Time for stories to start your morning sponsored by Gillette Clear Gel. The Colts blew the doors off Tennessee last yesterday, 38 to 10. Andrew Locke had his seventh straight game with at least three touchdown passes. CC, how impressed have you been with Locke? I'm very impressed. Man, they put an offensive line finally in front of him, but to see where he recovered from, Jenna, not only just his throwing motion, his overall confidence. He gave us a little light. He told us it was on the board. He might not play again. They made the right choice in Frank Wright. They made the right choice as far as the general manager, and he's making the right decision, putting some good players around Andrew Luck. And how about the general manager trading back in the draft, adding three extra picks, drafting a guy who might win offensive rookie of the year as a guard, the guy they needed more than anything, and now all of a sudden last five games, Luck hadn't been sacked. And he looks once again like he was in his third year, which was his best year. He's one of the best quarterbacks in football. Nick, give him a little treat next year. Who's going to be playing for the Colts? Oh, Le'Veon Bell. They going to be nice. I love you guys. <laughs> Tough one for Cam we're Newton just like and the what Panthers. The girls, who are the girls you hang out with? Marcy and Marty. Marcy, we're just like them, right? <laughs> Uh, the Panthers lost 2019. They failed to convert a two-point conversion that would have given them the win. Ron Rivera said, quote, I think you go for two on the road. See, did he make the right call? He made the right call because he's on brand, who Riverboat Ron is. So the team respects that. He's got the most dynamic athlete who's ever played quarterback in the 99 years in the league. So to me, this is not a gamble. To me, this was the right thing to be able to do, try to steal this game where they did not play well. Cam, he's been working on his fundamentals. North Turner's changed this game, but in the most critical time, you can see he panicked. Him. He does not step at the target with his left foot. He bails, open the gates, and then his arm sinks down. He's going to sail that ball. That's something that he struggled with throughout his career. But played a brilliant football game up to that bad throw right there. Despite what Ron Rivera says, I think this has less to do with home road and more to do with the fact that Graham Gano was having his worst game of the year. He missed his first field goal of the year, which was a 34-yarder, same length as an extra point, and then also missed an extra point. I think he thought if we kick it, it's about a one in four shot he misses it anyway may as well go for the win and had the right play had him open cam just made his worst throw of the day all right finally the bears took down the vikings last night chicago forced three turnovers including a pick six khalil max said after the game everybody showed up ready to play in this one so you see are the bears proving they're legit super bowl contenders they're now seven and three well the, they've beaten a lot of bad football teams and this is really their first quality win Last night's game in Chicago, people, because the Bears haven't been good, they don't realize, man, that's a tough place to play. Always going to be windy. Now it's starting to be cold with that type of defense swarming around you. The way they can collapse the pocket on that field, it's a mushy, mushy really, really slow field you can see in last night's game. The Vikings, they had opportunities early. But you can see this Bears defense on the back end. They've improved so much. We know what Khalil Mack's going to be able to do, but that front seven, they're going to present a lot of problems. If they can win at home, continue to play defense like that, yes, Trubisky, not turn the ball over. Matt Nagy, from a, from a strategy standpoint, he's a lot like Kansas City, a lot like the L.A. Rams. Now, he, they don't have the dynamic weapons. They don't have the big names or the quarterback. But you look from a speed standpoint, man, they present a lot of problems to a very good Vikings defense. You can see they put them in, they put their linebackers matched up on, on guys in space, and the Vikings had a, a lot of problems with the Bears. I believe that the Bears are legitimate, but this was an important win for them in their division against a team who had been playing great football. And to win the way they did, because typically the, the, the path to victory has been quarterback plays a clean game. Trubisky didn't. Trubisky had a couple picks in this game. He didn't play great, but what we are seeing is because Khalil Mack played injured and then missed some time for the first time in his career, he's now back fully healthy. And in his eight games, when he's been healthy, his first, well, actually, just his eight games with the Bears, including one game where he was injured, he's got eight sacks and five forced fumbles. I mean, the guy is just 
a remarkable football player. And even in, you watch guys give post-game interviews, football players, uh, next to the sideline reporter all the time. He just looks like a cartoon character. How broad his shoulders are. How, how he, he looks like it would be so miserable to try to block him. And then when you have the other guys up front who are playing some of their best football, yes. guys that the Bears have spent high draft capital mm -hmm. on, you say, okay, this is a defense that can do what they did to the Vikings, which was make Kirk Cousins look awful for three and a half quarters. If you, yes. if you went to bed early last night, you didn't see it. You see 25-20. Man, they, the Vikings had six points late in this football game, and Kirk Cousins was searching for things. If they lose this game, they're not in first place in the division anymore. Yeah. Vikings are sitting there at 6-3-1. and one. They're at 6-4. and four. Now they have legitimate separation between them and the Vikings. They are in full control of this division. They don't have to worry about the Packers coming up and catching them. Like everyone else is playing in my eyes at this point for the wild card. This was a dominant defensive performance that overcame a mediocre offensive performance. And I like one thing about Matt Nagy that I, I think people should look the next time they see a Bears game. He has his play sheet. And everyone on the play sheet, like it's a little tiny writing that you can't read. He has in the corner on both sides in giant bold letters, B-U. As a reminder to himself, listen, do not stray from what got you here. Do not get overly conservative. Do not change just because you have this great defense. Be you. And yesterday he was that. Trubisky made some plays late with his feet that were important. And the Bears right now, to me, look like the third best team in the NFC. Yeah, that's great. Don't, uh, you do everything the opposite. That's my philosophy. For you. <laughs> I need you to change. Change everything about yourself. <laughs> Where did that even come people. from? Yeah. Where did that even come from? You're just it's searching Monday. for laughs. It's a good day to catch a flame. <laughs> let's, uh, let's talk about the Saints because the Saints are really good. They played what looked like a JV opponent yesterday in the Philadelphia Eagles and beat them. And beat them bad, 48-7. to For the Saints, it was their ninth win in a row. Drew Brees continues his MVP campaign. He threw for 363 yards, four touchdowns. On the other side, Carson Wentz threw three picks and just 156 yards Oof. as Philadelphia now falls to four and six, the worst loss ever by a defending Super Bowl champion. Nick, are the Saints the best team in the league right now after what you saw yesterday? Well, the teams playing tonight are going to have something to say about that, certainly on the Kansas City side of things, see how they go into Los Angeles because we already have seen the Saints team against the Rams. So I, mm -hmm. I, to me, the Saints have as strong of a case as anybody, and if you gun to your head, if you said, yeah, they're the best team in the league, I don't think you're going to get too much pushback. They Right now, they have, in my eyes, surpassed Kansas City for the most consistently dominant offense in the league and that and that might be enough like the what they're doing as far as killing you on the ground with their quarterback complete completing four out of five passes see yesterday Drew Brees completed 73 percent of his passes yeah bad day and dropped his completion ah. percentage yeah. I mean that's a that's a guy who's hitting 400 now we're right? not in I mean we're not just like the third week of the season oh no. you know something this guy's off to a pace where he's gonna throw no. 60 touchdown pass now, we into the meat of the season now. You can kind of predict. He's got six games left. Yes. He's got six games left. He has 25 touchdowns, one interception, and 127 rating. It's, he, is, he is having what will go in the annals as one of the greatest quarterback seasons ever. And Traquan Smith. He, they were trying to give his job away, see? Yes. They brought in Des Bryant, throw up the X for him. They brought in Brandon Marshall. Brandon Marshall doesn't play. Traquan Smith, odd my career day, 10 for a buck yeah. 57. And their and wide receiver down. coach said he thought because his adjustment to the competition, he came from UCF, and he thought that he had seen enough that he was going to start to blossom in November and December and become a bigger part of their offense, especially once Teddy Gann went on injured reserve. Right. You can expect him to be more involved week in and week out. But the thing that I'm impressed with is Sean Payton has changed some of the things, how he does things. And the first play of the game, they have Tyson Hill in, the backup quarterback, the utility guy, guy, wildcat guy. Peyton loves him. They put him in at tight end. They run a special play. They've done some sweet motion with Alvin Kamara, like they're going to swing the ball to the left. The, 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 the quarterback blocks down on the defensive end, and there is a gaping running hole. I mean, 
This is how this is how smart you know he is. Sean knows if I motion, they're going to get in this defense. And he gashes them with Ingram. We talk about Drew Brees, but he gashes them with Ingram. I mean, they almost had 200 yards rushing. Yeah. If you give 200 yards rushing to Drew Brees, you're not going to be able to beat him, especially if you've got perfect conditions, be able to play inside, which it looks like they're going to be able to do all the way to the Super Bowl, which is in Atlanta, inside. Well, that's where, that's the thing. You and I were talking about this before the show, and I understand that the there's some school of belief, and you explained it well before the show, that being a dome team, your home field advantage has a ceiling to it because the other team gets playing that dome too. You get perfect yes. conditions, but the other team does as well. But this Saints offense might be the most perfectly constructed dome team we've ever seen. Like, as far as if, if you are completing four out of five passes and you have a running attack and you have all the different almost tricks you can run, what you don't want is for the X factor to be conditions. What you don't want is, oh, my God, it's just unlucky. We're at Soldier Field, and it's swirling winds, and what are we going to do? You, if, if you believe you're better than everyone, you want – all the variables removed. You, if you believe yes. we're better than you, you want perfect conditions. You want both teams to be fully healthy. Sure. You want all of those variables removed because you think we can just line up and beat you. All right, I got to ask you about the Eagles. How do you explain what's happening to this Philadelphia team this year? The only way you can explain it is just respect the NFL and its model. The model is made for parity. Now, we know they have a great roster, but that's why teams don't repeat in the NFL often because it's also a league too that they really the other 31 team because you only get one winner everyone else is a loser they break down everything that you do they study your personnel more than any other team and they try to either duplicate what you did or try to figure out what are things that they're doing I might be able to add to my program and in doing that you get a great scouting report on what they can do, but more importantly on what they can't do. Their offensive line, they have not had a great year. They were stellar. It's impossible to win in this league with poor offensive line play and the inability to, be able to get off the field on third down and give up big play. So you can't play pro football that way. Their quarterback has been good, Carson Wentz. They don't have a running game. So when you think you have this figured out, and you're a young organization being not the ownership, but Howie Roseman, he's young as a general manager. All right. Mm -hmm. Doug Peterson, he's young, green around the green all around his body as a head coach. So, yes, these are the growing pains of learning how to be successful. It doesn't mean that they couldn't be back in the hunt next year. No, they're going to be, as long as Carson Wentz there, they got a chance. But, that's, but I believe they got to learn from the – they made some major, major mistakes in trying to defend the Super Bowl crown. And that was the most disappointing part about yesterday's game, if you're an Eagles fan, is this, this institutional rot that has seemingly affected the entire team finally got to Carson Wentz. Like, Carson Wentz all of a sudden look, doesn't look like he did last year. Wentz, even during their previous five games when they were two and three, he was playing great football. Yes. Yesterday was worst game of his career rookie year included so all of a sudden if you don't even have number 11 out there slinging for you you got nothing with the way they're playing go ahead At number 11 being the most positive guy in the team and you saw that shot of him walking over to the sideline just slamming down I mean you, he mm -hmm. even you're right they were doing to this to people last year yeah they were hanging 40 on people going for it on fourth down late when they didn't need to just because they could and now they're on the receiving end of it yeah. And it sucks. Yeah. Oh, football don't any fun when you lose. <laughs> no. Got to take a break. I need more coffee. Coming up, who has the edge in tonight's big game between the Chiefs and Rams? First things first. Back. Saturday, buckle up for one of the fiercest rivalries in all of sports. We got it right. Number four, Michigan. Number 10, Ohio State. Battle for a spot in the Big Ten Championship. Coverage begins Saturday at 11 Eastern on Fox or watch anywhere on the Fox Sports app. Michigan, Ohio State. I thought your Buckeyes were trying to take a little steam out of this game with that performance this weekend. Man, a little they better escape. get ready. It's the week. Let's go. Let's go. They, Michigan got me nervous, though. Yeah, they should. <laughs> Back here, first things first, with our favorite guest, Coach Mangini. Here's how you know tonight's Monday night game is big, quite possibly the game of the year. Sure, it's the 9-1 Chiefs visiting the 9-1 Rams. Yes, it's Pat Mahomes and that offense against Jared Goff and that offense. 
But how about this? The NFL pulled their scheduled officials, replaced them with hand-picked refs. Even they know this is big. Here's Patrick Mahomes on tonight's game. When you play in this league, you want to play against the best, and uh, getting to compete against a team like this is going to be a great challenge for us, and uh, we're going to go out there and compete. Anytime you get a big stage, you, you want to go out there and, sh and show the world what you're all about, you know, as, as a team. So um, what better stage to do it Monday night at home? All right. Much hype, a lot of anticipation. Coach, what is the key to this game, in your opinion? Well, looking at this, it, it seems to me that third down is, is going to be the key, and, and Kansas City has actually done – a pretty good job defensively on third down. They're fifth in the league right now. Yeah. Where the Rams have struggled a little bit more. I think they're somewhere in the early, yeah, early 20s. And if they if they can if they can get the Rams off the field and be able to control the ball, that to me will be the difference in the game. Also, you look at the Rams last week, 273 yards rushing. And there's been some cracks in this defense, especially recently, and it's going to be interesting to see how they're able to fill those in, what mm -hmm. they've done to adjust over the last couple of weeks going into this game, and then on the flip side, how Kansas City is going to be able to exploit it. Listen, the narrative was set for the Chiefs at the beginning of the year through a month. Amazing offense, just as bad defense. But now that we're 10 games in, what we've realized is the Chiefs and the Rams defenses – very similar. Very similar statistically overall. Mm -hmm. They're both allowing right around 20. It's 24 points per game versus 23.1 points per game. The Chiefs defense cannot stop the run. And as of late, the Rams defense cannot stop the run. Neither one of those teams has been hurt badly by that because other teams are forced out of the run because the offenses are jumping out on them so quickly. I, I think you're spot on, coach. I think both of these teams are going to be able to score almost at will. And this game is going to come down to which team can make three or four plays the whole game defensively. A tipped pass that turns into an interception. A big stop on third and short that turns into a punt. Because they, I would set the over-under for punts in this game by each team at three and a half. Like, you're not going to see the, the punter out there often. And so, you don't need to make a lot of stops. But who can make a couple stops? And who can force the other team to kick field goals instead of touchdowns? Because it does feel like this game's a race to 35. Everyone, I just, I'm going to pump our brakes for a minute. Great matchup on paper. But this is something I do know. This is something I'm not guessing about. Both of these teams, I'm concerned about the preparation. Because both of them, there's tremendous distractions in this game being moved from Mexico City. And the Rams training last week in altitude in Colorado Springs and now coming about back to the wildfires in Los Angeles. They got a number of people on their staff and number of players who have been displaced. Kansas City and their fan base, they had 30,000 people, thought this game was going to be in Mexico City. Mm -hmm. So they were thinking they were going to have, you know, a nice following there in Los Angeles. And I do believe in preparation, you can be distracted. And it's just the smallest of little details. So I hope the game lives up to it. Also, Jenna, you mentioned in your read, the referees. Hmm. That's kind of strange. They got an all-star crew just for a Monday night regular season game. So these NFL crews, they work together. So typically, there's a little continuity. So now, I just believe, with an all-star crew, typically you let the players play more, like the playoffs. So this will be a physical game. You will probably see a lot more holding and everything down the field, wide receiver, the DB, that they're going to let go. So these are some of the things I'm going to look for from an X and host standpoint. The Rams and Sean McVay, how do they replace that productivity of Cooper Cup? And can mm -hmm. they continue either run the ball on third down to keep Kansas City's offense off the field? So I'm looking forward to seeing the game. I hope both teams are really have a fine focus to give fans what they're expecting on this 9-1 and one matchup, which is a rare, rare matchup this late in the season on Monday Night Football. Which of the two young quarterbacks do you think has more to prove in this game, Goff or Mahomes? Well, hopefully both quarterbacks won't take that approach. I think that's where you get into a lot of trouble is when you start thinking that you've got to do something different in the in these games because they're nine and one, you're nine and one, it's Monday night football. That's where that's where it starts to go south. And and Chris makes a great point. Going into a game like this, you want to prepare the way you prepared for all the other games because Routine. that's what got you to 9-1. and one. When you start looking at it as, oh, we're, we're going to have to make a play or I'm going right. to have to play outside of myself, that's, that's when, when nothing good happens. That, on the official side, 
I'd be frustrated if I was a head coach in the league. My game's not as important as this game. And, and there's a lot of <laughs> games that took place this week that have playoff implications. And the idea of putting together a crew for the first time for this game, to me, doesn't, doesn't seem very right. I really want to see the Rams' defense because here's the thing. Aqib Tlaib and Marcus Peters get hurt in the same game. Aqib Tlaib's injury has been so substantial he hasn't played since then. Marcus Peters has been playing but a much lesser version of himself. So they they lose one starting quarterback in full and one starting quarterback in part. I think it was week three of the year. The Rams defense, pass defense, has been, we talked about the rush defense, against decent quarterbacks. They played six games against Phillip Rivers, Kirk mm -hmm. Cousins, Russell Wilson, Aaron Rodgers, Drew Brees. In those six games, they're allowing a 120 passer rating, 16 touchdowns, zero interceptions. Good quarterbacks have carved this defense up. Now we'll see. Dante Fowler, he made the big play at the end of last week's game, or the big splash play. We know how great Aaron Donald is and his ability to impact the game every single snap. But the Rams defense has been susceptible. Along that same stretch, the Chiefs all of a sudden, since week three, lead the NFL in sacks. The Chiefs since week five, top four in the NFL in turnovers for us. So can the Chiefs get a couple defensive plays that the Rams can't match? That could be the difference because I think both of these teams, the young quarterbacks, I think Mahomes is a star and I think golf is excellent. I think both of these guys are going to be able to, in clean pockets, really eat up the opposing secondary. Yeah, with Dante Fowler, he gets the unsportsmanlike conduct earlier in yes. the game and he does make mm. the play later. And, and and I know you had Aqib Tlaib, you had Marcus Peters, and there's there's a lot of hype behind that, but defense isn't about one guy playing his way. It's about everybody playing together and understanding how all the parts fit together. And I think Kansas City has gotten better as the season goes on or has gone on to getting that point. Thank you for listening to the First Things First podcast. Remember, leave us a review and tell us what you think. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts and catch us on FS1 Monday through Friday, 6.30 a.m. Eastern. For Chris Carter and Nick Wright, I'm Jenna Wolf. So long, everybody.